Greetings. Greetings. Uh, my name is John. I'm Andreas, and Loveless will tear us apart. Thank you so much for taking the time today to uh, listen to this brand new podcast. Uh, just to give you all uh, who have never or aren't really familiar with Loveless Will Tear Us Apart or the concept behind this at all, um, this is really stemming from uh, the album battles uh, competitions that I was running on Facebook. Oof. Uh, I would say almost 10 years. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I kind of kind of got burnt out. It is a lot of work having to run everything uh, by myself with the amount of people posting in uh, nominations. So usually uh, it would be based on the theme and then people would submit uh, nominations and it's tracking everything in spreadsheets and then posting up those battles, tracking all the votes, uh, making sure people aren't voting twice. Uh, and in some cases not having uh uh, enlisting people from fan clubs <laughs> to join the group in order to make sure that, like, say, Suede wins. Uh, it's a long story, and I'll get into it some other point in time. That, that, uh, that's a personal recount there. Nobody just brings up Suede. You know, you'd be like, okay, the Rolling Stones fan club, but Suede, that had to have happened in real it, life. It necessarily did. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, but yeah, it'll be, definitely be saved for another point in time. Uh, but the desire to kind of – I took a break from it for a while because it was just uh, exhausting. It and... would take months for you. Like, two, like It was like over 200 ballots, and it would, t- it would literally take like two months to each competition, something like yeah. that. Yeah, 256 nominations, yeah. and uh, that was the thing. Like It just – with everything going on in the world the way that it was, uh, it really started to take a toll on me as well, so I decided to stop it. And then um, things are getting better. Uh, people are getting poked. Uh, overall, attitudes definitely improving, regardless of of what's going on out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the desire to kind of do it and just say, you know what, I've I've got the energy and the time to kind of want to put something into this. I want to do this. So that's when I reached out to Andreas and said, Hey, we tried to do this before, and it kind of just it was all on me and I wasn't there's just so many things going on that didn't quite work out. Let's give this another go. And... Let's have some musical fisticuffs. Why not? <laughs> exactly. And that's where we are now. So uh, thank you so much for tuning into this again. Uh, so just to give you a general idea of how this is all going to work is this. First off, Andreas and I will be debating uh, or actually talking about either two albums or two singles. Uh, these are albums or singles that have been nominated uh, from people within the group uh, for us to go and talk over. So at the end, after you finish listening to this all, uh, it's up to you. Who wins, who loses. Uh, you can uh, follow up with this uh, and leave your votes uh, through... Uh, either uh, YouTube where this will be posted uh, or uh, we can also include uh, a link to the group. Uh, well, two links. One will be for, for Facebook and one will be for uh, as well for anti-social media where this is going to find its new home. Uh, so that's where you can vote for your winners as well as uh, figuring out and giving us the answer to the question, what is the tie that binds both of these albums or singles together? Sounds good. And some of them are going to be a little bit more obvious than others. Uh, today's is going to be a no brainer, but down the road, it could, it could be something as obscure as Mike Patton did backing vocals on both albums. Something like you, it, we don't know. It could be something very obscure, but today's yeah. not that day. Today's training session. It's going to be a little bit more obvious. Exactly. And and thank goodness for that. Because, you know, as obvious as this is, I could definitely try and switch it up and make it something else. Because there's a lot to choose from uh, when it comes to these artists and these two bands facing off against each other. Uh, but in any case, let's, let's just kind of... Ah, let's rip the Band-Aid off and uh, dive into this. So today... Uh, I will be championing uh, what I consider probably one of the best 
albums to come out in the 60s. Probably my favorite album by this band. Uh, and uh, de- well, definitely the one I first kind of learned how to dance to. Uh, and that would be Sgt. Pepper's Lily Hearts Club Band by the Beatles. And I will, I could only select, well, first off, because this was sent in as the request, but other, like, even if it was up to me, I could only pick the antithesis to this album. And I don't mean Pet Sounds, because that's more of a complimentary album to this. I'm talking about the antithesis and who destroyed Sgt. Pepper's more than the Beatles themselves. I'm doing their follow-up, the White Album. So there you have it, folks. Uh, the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Against the Beatles, White Album. Uh, remember, at the end, and uh, when you submit your Who Wins This, uh, don't forget to include who, what the common bind that ties both of these albums and bands together. <laughs> and we will pick a winner. And... Uh, I'll explain the pricing and such later on. But uh, in any case, uh, we'll go alphabetical. So, Andres, why don't you go first? Okay, so we're going to do this in a bit of a, in, in a bit of a systemic order. So we're going to go with the history of both albums and their conceptions. We're going to go into the album covers themselves, which I think this episode is especially prevalent. We're going to go into the content and the songs, maybe point out some of our favorites, point out some gems that we think are underrated. We're going to go into the actual album sales and the success. And then finally, the historical legacy, which in this case... Both Beatles albums are beloved and uh, praised by all. So let's get into first the actual creation of these two albums. So these are both a part of the studio recording era of the Beatles. And even though it might make more sense to start off with Sgt. Pepper's, which came out a year before in 67, um, this one's especially interesting because while Sgt. Pepper's may, may have had some tension behind the scenes, this is where it was first very apparent in the music that the Beatles were having some friction. And that's to say because they were doing all sorts of stuff behind the scenes, like going on retreats, um, setting up their own scheduling recessions alone. Sorry, scheduling their their own recording sessions alone. Like, I believe what on some of these songs, Paul's literally recording by himself. John's literally recording by himself or like one other Beatle or session musicians. This is really where the whole schism in the Beatles happens. But at the same time, if you look at it that way, this is almost like all four solo projects happening, happening simultaneously. And it's almost beautiful for that at the same time. So, yeah, this album was recorded right when the friction was getting really hot. Um, and basically this was in the shadow of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which you're going to get into in a second, John. Mm -hmm. This, yeah, this isn't even called the White Album. That's just the nickname. It's actually called The Beatles. So it's a self-titled album. And what that reads to me is that this is a reinvention where it's like, okay, we figured out the pop album previously. Let's just break it again. And... That's what it feels like here. While the band was breaking, they wanted to break the formula as well. So we're going to get into the numerous ways that they did so, ranging from the album march to the songs themselves. But first off, let's find out why they wanted to break this. So what's the history of Sgt. Pepper's? Whew, okay, well, let's uh, start at the beginning. Uh, let's, let's rewind all the way back to about... Uh, yeah, why are they a recording band now, let's say? Okay, so in this case, uh, 1966, uh, the Beatles uh, doing their touring and such, and there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Like, uh, it's none more prevalent when they are actually performing live where they're playing and with, in some cases, really crappy PA systems that are like generally used for announcements and such. Uh, and they're supposed to play to thousands upon thousands of screaming fans that end up drowning out what they're playing. And the, the, the desire and the fever to see them play is so powerful that it becomes overwhelming. 
like people talk about uh phil specter being the being the 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 creator of the wall of sound uh Mm -hmm. they apparently had never been to a beatles concert because uh that's what they faced basically night after night well that's more like Uh, a wall of noise that's more like sonic youth territory maybe (laughs) get out of our way my bloody valentine we're here to stay um and it was it like they uh they were they were basically the, the story is they went on a tour of uh in the, in west germany and they received a, a telegram that said uh, do not go to tokyo your life is in danger uh so they were really kind of a bit perturbed because uh japan is at that point i was very religious and very conservative mm-hmm. and uh uh, they were also, I think, they were they were booked to play at uh, the the Budokan, uh, and because of that, which was also considered a very sacred place as well, um, there was a lot of concern that maybe something was going to happen. So there was increased security around them. They were being shuffled around all the time in armored vehicles. Uh, it's just a bad scene. Then they go to the Philippines and they have a run in uh, with 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 the. Uh, with people in the Philippines because they didn't visit Imelda Marcos. Uh, they're also extremely exhausted and tired because it just seems like they put out, uh, put out an album and they go touring, they put out an album, they go touring and it's just nonstop. <laughs> uh, what also kind of leads to this as well is um uh, and I'll we'll just make brief mention of this because we really don't need to get into it too deeply in order to like kind of talk about the albums at all. But uh, this is also around the time where uh, John had uh, justifiably made the comments that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. Yes. Again, uh, which if you just say it as that, uh, people will take offense, but it was basically taken out of context, mm-hmm. uh, which is to say that he was saying to teenagers uh, that, I guess, listen to rock and roll or pop music, that a lot of times, yeah, like, and it wouldn't just be the Beatles. It would be other pop acts or other rock acts that they listened to, that they had more of an influence on what teenagers were listening to or what they wanted to be than going to church on Sundays. Uh, unfortunately, that, with the media... Uh, got promoted heavily in America, and uh, they like people. Their Beatles record burnings, everything, which is great because they were buying records <laughs> to, to burn them. Uh, but that's sure. basically it. They as like to kind of like make things up to people. They went ahead and did a tour of the U.S. and uh, the, they're burnt out. They're tired of touring. Uh, and the ticket sales aren't doing that great either because obviously uh, you have a lot of people there that are religious minded there that just were not, uh, not digging what they were saying. Uh, even after, uh, Lennon repeatedly had to apologize for being taken out of context. So, uh, they get back to England and, uh, they're exhausted and George Harrison decides that he's going to leave the band. He's had enough. He's been worked like a dog uh, and just doesn't see the point of it. He doesn't want to keep touring. He doesn't want to keep being put on these expansive tours where they're going all over the place. They don't get time, any time to relax or take it easy. It's just one place after another after another. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, he, they, he was basically persuaded to stay on the idea that, eh, you know what, stay because – there won't be any more tours and he's like oh, okay cool like i'm not i wasn't expecting you guys to bend over backwards for me but all right uh and they basically from that point in time took a three-month break and uh they all kind of focused on their own stuff so you've got uh you've got george listening and becoming uh, very tuned in to uh music from india Mm -hmm. Uh, learning how to play the sitar. Uh, Paul is like working with George Martin on soundtracks. uh, Ringo's acting, I think. Yep. And John's acting and going to uh, art showings. Yeah. uh, Where he eventually meets uh, Yoko Ono. And 
Ringo, yeah, like he's doing a little bit of acting, but at the same time, too, he's just kind of chilling out with his wife and his kid and just enjoying life. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, biggest band in the world, uh, you can kind of do that sort of thing. So that's the that's kind of like the grand setup to this. You have this really huge, really huge band that everybody is like content to just be in their presence, not even hear them, but just be in their presence and see them perform live saying, OK, we've had enough of this. We mm-hmm. can't even enjoy ourselves. It's like, why are we even performing? We could just we could really just put out a bunch of cutouts of ourselves <laughs> on stage and just play tape and people wouldn't care because they would still be going like, oh, my God, we're seeing the Beatles. Right. And I think it's uh, it's a really cool build up to the whole studio recording only era because they were also becoming less business like when it came when it came to like, you know, their image and everything and more finely tuned with what they were listening to. Like um, we're going to get it to Sgt. Pepper's. Uh, that was a direct answer to Pet Sounds, which I brought up earlier by the Beach Boys, where Brian mm-hmm. Wilson and Brian Wilson similarly wasn't touring and he was staying at home while the rest of the Beach Boys toured. And he said, OK, let me figure some stuff out. So, um, you know, those are two albums that really broke the mold when it came to pop music. But with with the Beatles, I believe the first of these recordings was Rubber Soul, which was a little bit more folky, like folk rocky. But you could tell the lyricism is getting approved. But then, yeah. then Revolver happened, and Revolver has some incredible tracks like, um, oh, so, what's the last song called? My bad. The last song on 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 Revolver. Yeah, I, I remember, remember how. It goes. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you have like songs like the final song, "Tomorrow Never Knows," where it's got like backward stuff going, impeccable um, production, and it just sounds so psychedelic. This is when they were really coming into their own, and it's like, right, how do we... Like, this was, like, at the time, impossible music to play live. Like, Tomorrow Never Knows, you can't play that live with the backwards, whatever, unless you have a backing track. But they didn't care about that anymore. They were they were untethered to these responsibilities of being able to be these figures on stage. So instead, again, then came out Pet Sounds, so then... Paul McCartney and gang basically said, let's make Sgt. Peppers. So let's start off with, uh, I guess we could do like a snake formation where it's like, uh, we'll rotate positions each round. So now we're going to get into the album covers. And you were talking about cutouts, which is very interesting, but it wasn't the Beatles that were cut out. Something else happened with the cover of Sgt. Peppers. Why is this so iconic? Well, uh, when you're looking at specifically at the cover of the album, it's uh to us it's it's copied all the and i'm gonna you know what i should we should actually preface this by saying that um i I don't really have that great of a filter so i may be cursing quite a bit uh and and i'll be fine i I don't think anyone's really gonna object as long as i guess we put a notice up there saying hey you know there's a guy who can't keep his uh can't keep from cussing uh so believe me when i say this it's fucking copied all the goddamn time. There is not a single. The Simpsons are like copying it, copying it. You're seeing like you're seeing people using it for like commercials where they say, "Oh hey," or just kind of like allude to it. You know, even uh, well, more so in a I guess a mocking sense. But I mean, even like Zappa, kind of like kind of did a yeah the mothers of invention yeah yeah did their own take on on the front cover so what what the concept was was that uh originally they wanted to do uh the idea was that the cover was going to be uh looking like if they just played a concert at the park and it'd just be a con a picture of the the group after the after the concert with the crowd who just watched the concert watching them uh and they said okay well we can really do this by using cardboard cutouts and we can work along that way and then being at the 60s and the fact that at this point in time the boys are are doing uh, possibly copious amounts of lsd uh the idea is like okay well we can totally be this band 
and so they got themselves like an actual like band costumes uh and for uh the cutouts to this side they weren't going to use regular joe blows they were going to actually use uh cutouts of different celebrities uh so you first off you're the first thing you're going to notice when you actually look at the cover is just like it's it's vibrant like it's vibrant it's uh it uh, what's the best way to describe it it's okay so it's vibrant you've got the four of them standing proudly in the front behind uh behind uh, the bass drum cover that says sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band uh with beetles and and red flowers in front of it and then you've got to the to their right not our right but you have cardboard cutouts of themselves mm -hmm. and then they have several cutouts of different celebrities uh different writers basically people that are famous uh so it kind of like geez if i could even put my mind to like what uh like who is on that cover is just insane. I think it's like Bob Dylan. Or, um, am, am I wrong? Yeah, uh, no, Muhammad no, you've, Ali. You've, you've got Bob Dylan on there. You've got Brando on there. You've got Tony Curtis, uh, Monroe, H.G. Wells, Laurel yeah. Hardy, Sigmund Freud, Einstein, Karl Marx. Uh, uh, and but it was also missing two people. Because Lenin, being the, the the quirky little guy that he is, uh, wanted the images of Adolf Hitler and Jesus Christ, and Harrison wanted Mahatma Gandhi on there. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, EMI said, uh, we don't think so. So they didn't put him on there. Because, I mean, the last thing you want to do is be like, oh, yeah. So these are supposed to be people who just watched the Beatles perform. They must be fans. And going, oh, yeah, by the way, Hitler is a fan of the Beatles. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but again, it's just Lenin not really giving a shit. So, uh, Which that was he, it. Yeah, he, he just generally just didn't give a shit. It's from the sounds of it. Yeah. Uh, the cost of the cover art for the, for the album was 3,000 pounds, which is equal to about 55,000 pounds at this point in time. Uh, nowadays and uh, basically covers should normally cost about 900 pounds nowadays uh at least by that kind of pricing uh but it was just extravagant but i mean this was like their big album and they decided to just say okay well, this is what we're gonna do um uh, Also, to add, not just with the cover of the album, but with the back of the cover, uh, back of the album as well, uh, has what we see now is kind of commonplace, has the lyrics to all the songs. Uh, but Sgt. Pepper's was actually the first album to do that, where they said uh, they were just going to put them up there and, and have people have access to it just by looking at the back of the record rather than either trying to find a pamphlet inside the record or trying to make out what we're trying to sing or having in a gay fold or whatever. Yeah. And I think in, you know, a very, very um, contrasting way. So you have everybody and their kid on the front of Sergeant Peppers on the follow-up, the Beatles, literally nothing, not, no, no one, nothing, barely even words so now you'll see the title in black font on the front it says the beatles but back then this was just raised lettering like this was embossed in like onto the cover so otherwise what you have here is a tabula rasa where you're looking at just a white sleeve and that might seem you know maybe lazy uninspired i think it's the complete opposite i think this was a very bold decision because we're desensitized into thinking about the album art that we have now. Think back to the 60s. Nobody had this. In the 60s, album art was your way of promoting yourself in stores. I mean, there wasn't any internet. 
you know, the radio can only say so much. You're not going to say, go buy the album with all the people on it. No, you just went into a store and you would either go by name or you would go by what something would look like, you know, get, get, get a feel for it. That was this advertising tool. This had neither. So this was like the boldest decision that a band like the Beatles could have taken where first off, it's just not advertising at all. Unless you look at it as, you know, a, like the, the reverse psychology side of things where there's nothing there. So now I'm drawn to it, but I see it more as this open slate where it's like, here you go. You have all of these songs. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. And it's a double album, by the way. This is just its own thing. You decide what you want this to be. And I think that's very bold in comparison to the concept album and the concept art that came with Sgt. Peppers. Yeah. No, and I, I totally agree with you on that part. Um, it's kind of funny because, yeah, I get what you're saying about it being the blank slate. You know, like, mm -hmm. forget everything that we've done up to this point. This it, is it's literally the called the Beatles. Exactly. Yeah. It's called the Beatles as if it's like, you didn't know what we were before. That's not us. This is us. But it's, yeah. it's interesting because at the same time, and I guess we're going to go into the songs now. So I guess this is my segue. And I guess I'll start off with the songs. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because this is the Beatles, but this also isn't the Beatles because I brought up earlier, this almost felt like four solo albums happening at the same time, yeah. clashing together and making this, this, this this nothing about it is homogenous it just is a series of songs which is exactly against what they were doing on sergeant peppers which was a revolutionary album and you'll get into this for its cohesion you know for it being a concept album this was the opposite but at the same time because it was so intentional in that way it almost is a concept album so i'll explain what i mean first off again this thing is, we're getting into the songs now. This thing is, like I said before, it's a double album. So you've got a whole series of songs on here. You've got, um, let's see, okay, so on, on side, on, on the first album alone, you, you've got 17. That's, that's a lot right there. But then you've got another album, which has 13 so smack that together, and what do you have? You have pretty much close to close to two hours, or like an hour and a half worth of just an incredible music. But what is this music? There's no theme here. There's no intro. There's no outro, which, John, you'll get into in a second. Mm -hmm. There's a complete onslaught of the senses almost, where you, know, you start off with Back in the USSR, which is a straight-up McCartney track, you know, very heavy on the guitar, it's very in your face, but then right afterwards, it's Dear Prudence, which is, it's a ballad, cut into Glass Onion, and immediately you're like, okay, none of these songs have any relevance to one another, but all of them are quality. All of this is quality, which I know some people disagree with, but the older I get, the more that, like, even the, the more daring things on this album, I'm, like, obsessed with. So, otherwise, you've got iconic songs like While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which it's weird that I'm going to say this because, you know, it's a George Harrison written song. It's got Eric Clapton doing the solo. This is one of my favorite bass lines I've ever heard. <laughs> so again, it's very strange, but in this song, I feel like Paul McCartney overall, while not the most talented bassist on earth, is a criminally underrated bass writer. Like when it comes to the lines he created on this song alone, it's one of my favorite top 10 favorite bass lines. Like I, I, I forced myself to learn this early on. Um, but let's get back into the actual song outside of my own bias. It's a, it's a, it's a classic. It's, it's fantastic, but it's not just that you've got Obladi Oblada, which is a classic USSR is a classic. Prudence is a classic. Um, Blackbird is a classic. I could keep going. Like there are so like, they're, like just more birthday, sexy Sadie, Helter Skelter, which is seen as one of the early signs of what heavy metal was going to become. That is a classic. You got Revolution One, which you know the Revolution single was more of the classic, but the stripped down version here is still really nice. You've got so many things, but let's get into 
the underrated cuts and the huge the hugely weird stuff on here which is this is why this is like my favorite Beatles album so the underrated stuff first this is a very very unpopular take I've I'm just gonna say it long 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 the George Harrison song that ends side three is one of my favorite Beatles songs I've ever heard I think it's a gorgeous overwhelming ballad that I don't think anyone talks about enough I think it's just, uh, I think it's a stunning song. Otherwise, you have something like the really raw Your Blues. Like this, this, well, it's a blues song, naturally. That's what it's called that. But John Lennon basically having these crazy lyrics about feeling like he wants to die. And it just keeps going and going. But it's like so raw in how it is, like in, in its blues nature which the Beatles just weren't doing before. They were trying to appeal to like the masses, but this is why I love this album. Each, each song is clearly what it's supposed to be. Your blues is straight up a blues song. Helter Skelter is, is Paul McCartney being like, yeah, let's just make some noise. Let's just do this. And then you've got Harrison being like, Hey, I just want to do some nice guitar finger work. I just want to make some nice music. Eric Clapton, come join me, you know? And then (laughs) to go back to Lennon now, You've got one of the most polarizing songs, and you already know where I'm going with this. <laughs> one of the most polarizing songs ever in the history of music, and obviously it's Dear Prudence. No, it's uh, it's this song called Revolution 9, which John Lennon was inspired by these avant-garde loop artists of the time. And he's got this set, this penultimate song Eight minutes long, there's zero cohesion, there's zero formula, it's just straight up experimental noise. What other band at the time was doing this, you know, with such a podium, let alone the freaking Beatles? And it wasn't just Lennon alone, obviously Yoko Ono was there to help him, but it was also the honorary fifth member George Martin helping with them it was also George Harrison helping him making this thing so it was a big gang effort to make arguably the most experimental song in in popular radio music history and then they have the guts to end on a Ringo Starr song wishing us good night as if nothing had happened and I think that's just I think that's I think that's brilliant. I think it's fucking genius. That <laughs> basically they just do that. And that's why I love this album. It's everything all over the place, but it's all it's all centered because they're the Beatles and at this point they were bigger than Jesus. They could do whatever the fuck they wanted and they proved it. Too true. Too true. Um Yeah. It's um <sighs> Uh, we were talking about uh, the, both albums uh, before we started recording, and uh, Andreas explained that you know like he was once a uh, was a member of the Sgt. Pepper fan club, and then I was, uh, I was. <laughs> and then just was it two years ago that was a white album that that grabbed you? Is that right? Yeah, because at least for like, because my dad loves the Beatles, and I've grown up on their music, and it's something that I've tried to venture out to check out myself. The White Album I saw as, I I just, I didn't get it at one point, but then somebody told me, it's not about loving the whole album, you're supposed to pick the songs that you like, and I believed it, but then it was like two or three years ago where it's like, no, that's wrong, I genuinely love every second of this, as weird as it gets, as popular music sounding as it gets it's really all over the place it's like you're, you're traversing the musical landscape in an hour and a half i love it hmm. um yeah and, and i explained that uh i was thankful that i was given sergeant peppers because <laughs> i've i i'm not going to disagree with you there is some really great songs on here like if we're if i'm going going track by track uh side one <sighs> is it see the, I, what i think of this is is this i think the white album would be an awesome beatles record if it went from four sides down to two i think there's a lot of stuff that could be 
cut from the album to make it awesome. Uh, I think if you ditched, like, I, I, I'm trying not to be so so judgmental about this album at all, but <laughs> my God, Obladi Oblada has to be one of the, and I love Mecca. McCartney, like, like growing up as a kid, I would listen to coming up all the time, going to the diner with my, with my dad for like dinner. Uh, so they had the, like the little jukeboxes at each, each table. And I listened to that song incessantly. Uh, Give my regards to Broad Street was one of my favorite movies, even though it's just, oh God. Cause that was just all about Paul McCartney. Right. But I got to tell you, Obladi Oblada is a fucking awful song. It should be buried. It should be taken out in the back of like, of like a like a, where they went and for like a spiritual retreat in India, take it out in the back, have it shot, and then tossed into the river and let it flow with all the other other corpses and such because it is probably one of the worst Beatles songs I've ever heard in my life, uh, and I can't shake it. So yeah, if Oblada Oblada was an onside one, uh, and. Uh, Continuing story of, of Bungalow Bill, slide one would be fucking amazeballs. Uh, side two is all right. Uh, McCartney doing Why Don't We Do It in the Road. Oh, it's like, oh, it's so good. Like, you can tell he has such a, uh, he has such a love for, like, African American rock and roll, because he he consistently when he gets into his hollering and screaming, he's doing his best to channel Little Richard, mm -hmm. and and the other like any other rock artists or any other blues singers that he's heard, and god damn he's got the fucking pipes to do it. Why don't we do it in the road? It's like it's 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 a great McCartney song because. It doesn't sound like a McCartney song. It's just it's like he's always been the pretty boy. He's always the one with the boyish face and the impish charm. And then he fucking whips this out and just kind of smacks you in the face with it. You're like, oh, my God. Paul, what the hell? And I guess that's maybe why people thought he he died in a, in a car accident and someone else had taken his place because cheese and crackers. That song is fucking awesome. What about uh, Rocky Raccoon, though? Also a McCartney cut. Mm, oh no! Come on, don't don't do my Rocky Raccoon like that. Come on. Hey, you know what? I'll give. I'll I'll say this much. I'll, without without uh, like I said, without trying to undermine the album, Rocky Raccoon has significance to me because that's where they got the name Rocket Raccoon for, for Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Yep. Even though there's like zero correlation, because Rocky Raccoon is like a, like a almost like a like a Western ballad, like of like this these, mm -hmm. this cowboy showdown, it's it's awesome. Yep, uh, Julia is such a fucking beautiful song. My God, yes. Uh, and it's it's crazy because you think of like how at times would unhinged be a good a good way to describe uh describe Lennon on this album uh well yeah if he's doing stuff like you're a blues we talking about like suicide and stuff yeah or oh, revolution nine yeah okay yeah he's unhinged he's, he's clearly okay. unhinged <laughs> so we can clearly say that like he's completely channeling a lot of things that he's dealing with in his head uh and expressing himself in ways he never thought he could yeah having said that Julia is such a fucking beautiful song. Like, yeah, he has such a there's such a sweetness to him in this. Uh, it's like you can't you can't bypass it at all. Uh, it's 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 fantastic. And then you're going on to let's see, okay, your blues. Oh, the guitar on that's so good. Helter Skelter. Um, like you said, classic. It was classic. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was be because uh, Maka thought the that he wanted to do a song that was louder than the Who. Yeah, I uh, think so. That sounds about right. 
and uh yeah so they, they just went ahead and uh so many fucking takes and of course you get the infamous i've got blisters on my fingers because <laughs> they recorded so many takes of this really without a break and then you got poor poor ringo who just seems to be like the the rhythm punching bag here just Dude wasn't like, having his george best day <laughs> yeah, exactly uh and then side four which is like revolution one yeah i like the single version of that song better than the the, the album version mm-hmm. uh revolution nine is is all right again it's uh wait, yeah. wait yeah okay that, that, that's very weird i've i've heard people hate it or like me they're like okay i get this i've never heard all right that's interesting i think it's all right because when you look at what he and the, what they were trying to do with it. And I mean, the Beatles, if anything, they always wear, they tend to wear their influences on their, on their sleeves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with revolution number nine, you're, you're having Lennon say, Hey, I've listened to all this. Well, I guess, uh, tape collages which would we now would be considered like sampling i've listened yeah. to all these like artists doing sampling and such and this really i'm like i i, I like this is my bag uh and you can't blame them for that like it's it's way out there and you're right there's people that either hate it uh uh and you have people going like yeah like i get it like you said me uh it's it's. I think it's interesting that they decided they, that he had it on there. I can see why Paul was very like wise as crap on this album because it's not. It's not definitely not a McCartney like song, but it's also funny because uh, Paul was really into that stuff before this happened so i think he was even kind of listening to like cage and stuff before they did sergeant peppers uh so for him to like look at at what john did and say oh you know what like i can't believe this is on here i think it's i i wouldn't hesitate to say he's saying that because he's pissed they didn't get to do that first Maybe. Well, I mean, if you listen to something like Ram, he clearly, McCartney down the road, clearly was into the idea of, um, you know, treading off the road of just traditional pop music and trying to figure out how can you enhance this type of a thing. So that's all like McCartney was like unwilling to experiment. He's clearly done so in his own time. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so if, if I'm going to go with my favorite songs on the album, uh, uh, okay, why don't we do it in the road? Uh, Glass Onion, Dear Prudence, uh, and Your Blues and Julia would be the songs I would say like are the absolute standouts on here. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip Helter Skelter because... I think enough has been said about that. And uh, I used to love that song, but I think it's for me, it's I loved it so much that I overplayed it for myself. And now I'm just like, if I hear it, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> screaming Beatles music, awesome. But I, I can't, I, I think I've burnt myself out, uh, burnt myself out on that song. So You've got really blisters on your fingers. I've got blisters in my eardrums. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So what about. What about Sgt. Pepper's now? This this concept album where it's start to finish, supposedly a story. I believe there is. Not everybody believes so. Let's hear about Sgt. Pepper's because you're right. I, I It was my favorite Beatles album once upon a time. So let's rewind back to our conversation at the beginning here. Where we're talking about what led up to these two albums. You've got one of the biggest bands in the world, burnt out from touring. They kind of just go off and do their own thing. And uh, it's the 60s. People are experimenting quite a lot. And you're looking at it and say, okay, all this stuff is going on. And then they get back together and Paul has this idea to say, hey, 
yeah, let's. Uh, he still wants a tour, but you know the other guys don't want to do it anymore. And he's like, okay, well, you know what? We can do that. That's cool. But how about this? And I'm I'm picturing this like little scene. They're kind of like chilling out at like at one of their homes, smoking a bit of the green, a bit of the devil's lettuce, maybe maybe having a couple of hits of acid. And Paul's like, you know, like we're just not the Beatles if we're not touring. My, wouldn't it be cool if we did an album where we weren't the Beatles at all? Mm-hmm. And the guys were just like, <laughs> "Sure, Paul, uh, have another, have another hoot, dude. You're all good. <laughs> like, get a little of this guy." Um, but he went into it, and when we were talking before about how uh, Rubber Soul had influenced Pet Sounds, Rubber Soul was influenced by by Dylan. Yeah. So Rubber Soul was the answer to Dylan. Yeah. Then Pet Sounds became the answer to Rubber Soul. And then John and Paul hear Pet Sounds and they're like, the fuck? Like, these are the guys that have been dragging around surfboards and singing about cars. And this is what they come up with? Well, fuck, if they can do that, so can we. Yeah. And it wasn't just Pet Sounds. A lot of people kind of tend to skip out on this but it's also been said that uh they are also influenced by freak out by the mothers of invention yeah uh which then brings it into this whole other like crazy like circle it's like okay so mothers of invention influenced the beatles and the beatles did sergeant peppers and the mothers of invention then did a riff on that like it just it's cool how it just kind of flows and goes in circles and that kind of thing um so when they when they start doing the recording um uh, they, they sit down and say okay we're going to do this they come up with two two well three songs so they come up with when i'm 64 uh penny lane and start uh, strawberry fields forever and uh EMI really pushed the band to get a single out. So they're like, oh, oh, we gotta, you guys are on tour right now. We gotta keep this cash cow going. So like, fuck. All right. Uh, put out a single. We'll make it a double A side. And we'll have Penny Lane on one side, Strawberry Fields Forever on the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they put it out. And reception to it was like, eh, nobody really, nobody really got it. Uh, but to the Beatles, it didn't matter because I mean, honestly, those are two great fucking songs, and they had to put out a single. And without really having those songs as part of attached to anything, just like we're tossing out a single here to keep you keep you rabid fans and the record company happy, there's really no point of reference to it at all. So people are kind of going like, "Well, what? Like, don't get me wrong; these songs are great, but like." This is this is the Beatles. What the hell's going on? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they they really start doing the work on getting the rest of uh, Sergeant Pepper put together. So uh, when you're looking at it, the first thing that that really hits me about this album is the fact they did it with only four with with a four track recorder. Yeah. So they recorded stuff, and then they would record it. They record four tracks and they record it down to one. And then they record another four tracks, record it down to one. And they just keep doing it over and over and over again. So suddenly you have all these layers, but it's like, it's just genius. It's like, we're not limited by this at all. We can toss this in. We can do that. <clears throat> Splicing tape like they work for the BBC Radiophonic. Like it's ridiculous. Like I can only imagine what, kind of mess that all looked like having to be running around snipping looping it here there and everywhere else like abbey road like must have looked like uh, it must have looked like several tape decks that just suddenly exploded all at once Mm -hmm. uh but they when they realized that pet sounds they could do that kind of stuff and be it still be a pop band 
they said, fuck it, we'll do where the hell we want. Like, we can, we're not the Beatles here. We're, we're, we're Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So that's what they start off with. They go with Sgt. Pepper's, which is like, the considering it's now, it's, it's considered one of the first concept albums out there. So the idea is the first song is the intro. Like this is, you're, you're looking for the Beatles. They're no longer here. They're, they're sipping their mushroom tea. Mm -hmm. This is, they we're going back to simpler time. This is Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So it's, it starts off with that. And just when the song is like winding down, it starts winding up for another as they count in Billy Shears which is Ringo singing his first song of the album. Uh, no, actually, I think it's his only song. Yeah, it's his only song on the album. What am I saying? Yeah. Uh, with a little help from my friends. I fucking love this song so much. It is like one of my go-tos when I do karaoke. Uh, well, it's, because... the easy, it's like one of the easiest songs in the world. Like I can't yeah. sing for shit, but yeah. I could sing that. It's yeah. Perfect. And it's so good because it's like, it's it's such a great they really did such a great job on this song and you can tell how much they all love each other and how much they love fucking Ringo because they're like baby this song is for you like this is all for you and it's it's just great I don't think yeah I think it's I would say it's probably Ringo's best singing best song singing song for the Beatles bar not uh you go from there and you get into Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds, uh, which is just you you've gone from like these two great kind of like almost like big bandish kind of songs, and then you go into Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds, and suddenly it's like, oh, this is when the acid kicks in. Because yeah. suddenly you're talking about cellophane flowers, rocking horse people. Uh, and just all this vivid, vivid, vivid imagery, and uh, it just completely pushes the first two songs aside. And from that, you're going on a trip. Like you're you're kind of going on a trip, and all of a sudden you get stopped because as soon as you finish with Lucy and Sky with Diamonds, you get hit with Getting Better, uh, which is like, again, it's a it's a great McCartney song. Uh, made only greater because fucking Lennon to tosses in like it can't get can't get no worse. Like yeah. it's such a great balance, and I love how they work so well here. It's like they just kind of they just kind of like they bring their own personalities and like so they're not detracting from each other. They're just like oh hey by the way this like it's just kind of be like they put their own stamp on it, but they don't take away. They don't take anything away from anybody else's songs. Mm -hmm. Then you got fixing the hole. She's leaving home and then ending off with being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Then side two, where it's again, it's uh, much like you were saying about white album. It's kind of a bit all over the board within you, without you. It's like George Harrison saying, Hey, you know what? I'm going to introduce you guys to something called the tablet. <laughs> and you guys are going to fucking love, love Indian music as much as I do. Which well, is his second time after revolver. So he, th this time he was like really going for the soundscape, really going yeah. the distance. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. Like he, 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 he hung out with Ravi Shekhar, you mm -hmm. know, to like learn properly do this and not be like some, so he didn't want to be the 60s version of a dude sitting underneath a tree with an acoustic guitar singing to the girls about rivers and shit. Yeah. He wanted to have, he not only was interested in Indian music and culture, but he wanted to do it justice. And he felt, I think he felt that he had a great podium to share that with people and say, you know, there's more to like music than just four bars and a like a, a standard drum beat and screaming guitars. Uh, when I'm 64 is 
it's it's a good song. You can uh, really hate when McCartney talks about his life in the future. That's what this is. Oh, bloody you <laughs> like, You just hate when McCartney looks forward. That's what this is. When I'm 64 is a is a good song, but I think uh, I think it's uh, I, I just don't think I think it doesn't fit the album at all. And when uh when I really? finish off listening out the rest of the songs. I'll explain. Uh, so when I'm 64, then you've got Lovely Rita, which is another great fucking song. That chorus is so good. Uh, good morning, good morning. Fantastic as well. Then you're ending off with two. So you're kind of wrapping up everything with uh, the reprise, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Uh, but it's sped up. It's kind of like the, hey, we're rushing you out the door now. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Yeah. The show is over. As soon as that's fucking done with it, with the, like the crowd noise at the end, you get a day in the life. Probably consider one of Lennon's best fucking Beatles songs. Probably consider one of the best Beatles songs. Uh, crazy. Just, just so good and so I remember um, listening to listening to that song the first time when I was a kid and uh, I was just taken back by like, how good it sounded the sudden like pop up of like where John brings a bit of the cynicism into uh, into getting better yeah, you've got him being like, "This is the world. This is the life we live. This is what's going on," and then you've got like, you've got Paul just pop in, being, like, "Oh hey, woke up, got out of bed, drank comb across my head." But it's, it's interesting like, because it's like uh, Lennon's version of "This Is Life" is I'm reading about this this shit on the news. Uh, McCartney says. This is a routine. I go to work every day, or like I go to school every day. Here, I, we're we're gonna get up morning, have our breakfast, get on the bus. They're very completely different looks at what life is, and I'm gonna get into what I think the the, the concept of the album is after you wrap up. Awesome. Um, and then you also go back into, uh, you go back into the song, and uh, the first time I heard the ah. ah, ah, ah uh, in this song, uh, it it made all the, I guess, well, I would have had arm hair on me when I was a kid. Uh, it made the hairs on my arm stand up, or it definitely gave me goose pimples. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it just ends, and you hear this fucking note that you don't think will ever end. It just stretches. It's at least stretches. a minute, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's so that's it. Like that's the album. Uh, going back to what I was saying about when I'm 64. Uh, ideally, I think the best Sgt. Pepper's album would be when I'm 64. Is it like taken off? And I would put I would actually put Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane in there. The fact that they had to to put those songs out as a single. And then say, okay, you know, we're not going to include these on the album. Was a huge mistake. I think if they had those two songs on there, uh, especially when you when you look at uh, look at when I'm 64, like Penny that I could see Penny Lane replacing when I'm 64, and then Strawberry Fields Forever would be right between getting better and fixing a hole. I really like the, like, there's no literal bridge, but I really like those two together, though, myself, to be honest. They're totally so similar, but, like, not in a bad way that it gets boring, in my opinion. Yeah. Are oh, you talking getting better and fixing a hole? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, the reason why I would have put, put Strawberry Fields in between the two of them was just to kind of continue it on with John... Paul, John, Paul. Oh, I see. That's the only reason why. Because then you've got like two Paul. Then you'll have like fixing the hole and she's leaving home, which are like two Paul songs. And then you get you get the the John song at the end. Uh, 
So that's the only reason why I would put it there. Like I, I mean, you could put it right after releasing this guy with diamonds, but then I think you're leaning too much into. Uh, yeah, that would be too similar. Psychedelia. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of want to break it up and be like, bang, 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 because like, this is who they are. Uh, so th- those are the songs that make up uh, the awesomeness. Uh, what many people would consider be considered the first concept album uh, of Sgt. Pepper's. So what are your takes on the songs there, Andres? Well, first off, as you know, um, this was previously my favorite Beatles album. And um, my thoughts on the premise. So concept, I know a lot of people would disagree, but here, here are my thoughts. So you've got the intro and you've got the reprise which a lot of people think that that's kind of a half a half baked um, kind of reason to think that this is a concept. But here are my thoughts. There's a specific reason why the rest of the songs are where they are and A Day in the Life is where it is. So I believe that Sgt. Pepper's is, it's the Beatles. We know it's the Beatles, but it's basically their, their, um, their ability to say, hey, we can basically do whatever we want within these parameters. This is supposed to be an escape from life. So, or like not even escape from life, but like a reframing of life in such an interesting way. Like getting better talks about some really weird stuff. If we really get into it lyrically, like domestic abuse, where it's like, oh, but no, it's okay. I, I beat my wife, but we're, we're getting better now. My bad. Um, Lovely read us about a meter maid, which, uh, you know, um, McCartney falls for, which also lovely read us one of my favorite Beatles songs. There's no, there's no qualms there. I don't, I don't dislike any of these songs. Um, fixing a holes as rudimentary as it sounds, but that's why it's beautiful. Cause like at the same time, it fits with being the benefit for Mr. Kite, which almost has like a circus feel to it. And right. this is why I don't mind when I'm 64 because they're turning, his life into the spectacle along with everything else. Like, uh, good morning, good morning, a uh, little help from my friends. These are all like so rudimentary, but they fit amidst Mr. Kite and Lucy in the Sky because it's turning everyday life into the spectacle amongst these other sites. So then when it wraps up and it gets into a day in the life, it's so tonally different. Like, as soon as like the crowd fades out and that like the guitar and the piano start, you just know that this is like, this could have been the start to a whole new album that you're not going to hear ever, ever. You're only going to hear, you're only going to hear this one song, which is technically two songs spliced together, but that's all you're going to get. And it's uh, just, just off the bat, my all time favorite Beatles song. One of my all time favorite songs ever is a day in the life. So I absolutely adore it, but I love how it ends as well. Um, yeah, because it's, as I said earlier, it's Lennon and McCartney's drastically different takes on everyday life and what that would actually sound like outside of the the concept of the album, which in itself becomes a part of the concept. But um, the way it ends, just with the piano chord played on, like I think it's like three or four different pianos at super loud volume and it just rings out. That's life. There's no crowd to clap you out like there is at the end of the reprise. There's not. There's nothing. You just. You just go. It's just done. It. And life just keeps going. When you die, you die. It keeps going without you. You keep going in your own way through life itself. It. That's just it. There is no outro in life. It just goes. And to me, that wraps everything up so beautifully. So that's that's how I feel about this album and what it means to me, which might not be what the Beatles had had wanted, but I think art is also completely up to the interpretation of the listener sometimes. Mm-hmm. No, and I, I think that's actually a pretty pretty cool take on it all. Uh, honestly, yeah, I think that kind of works within that. Uh, to answer your question, it was three pianos and a there harmonium. Oh, okay. I knew there was something. There we go. <laughs> Uh, they also added in uh, uh, a high frequency tone uh, to basically make dogs ears prick up when the song played and ended. Uh, See so, that I've got like no artistic comment on. I don't know what that 
<laughs> I think that's was, just a thing. <laughs> it was it was Lennon's uh, suggestion to kind of like annoy or like basically get dogs involved with the album, and then after that you get the the loop out, which is uh, gibberish music. Uh, Paul and John saying random things. And that's... Well, it depends on what version you're listening to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are that's uh, the whole kit and caboodle with that that album. Okay, so how did um, these sell now? How did Sgt. Pepper sell? Well, <sighs> thirty-two million copies sold worldwide of Sgt. Pepper's. Uh, last counted up to twenty nineteen. Uh, it was, uh, it was re- when it was released, I believe, uh, it, okay. So it copped, uh, the record retailer albums chart, uh, for 23 consecutive weeks, uh, in the UK, uh, with a further four weeks at number one in the period through, uh, from 67, ju- the 10th of June, 1967, all the way to February, 1968. The record sold 250,000 copies in the UK during, for, during its first seven days. Uh, the album held the number one position in the Billboard Top LPs chart for 15 weeks and remained in the top 200 for 113 consecutive weeks. Uh, also top charts in many other countries. 2.5 million copies sold within the first three months of its release. Uh, it's exceeded the commercial success of any other prior Beatles, Beatles album uh, in the UK was the top best-selling album of 1967 and of the decade. Uh, cool. They, they, they say estimated that it sold about 2. 2,360,000 copies in the U S by December, 1967 and 3. 372 million copies by the end of the 60s. What's very weird is you brought up the fact that it was like the best selling Beatles album, and apparently the one to beat it, and this is shocking even for me, even though I'm taking this one side, it was the White Album, which again is my favorite, but it, that to me is just very strange because it's so up in the air in terms like. It's not as grounded as Sgt. Pepper's or Revolver or Rupper Soul, but I guess maybe it was all the individual singles. So this thing to date has gone platinum 24 fucking times, which is oh, crazy. Um, and that's not each side. So it's not like 12 times two. It's, it's <laughs> 24. So technically it's gone 48, but no, let's, let's not split hairs here. Um, yeah. So that's crazy alone. Um, 12 million copies in the US. I have a feeling this might have to do with um because earlier when this was first released, it had little serial numbers to identify each album. Mm-hmm. Um potentially that could have created a lot of intrigue initially. I know it's like I think it's like the most coveted album now is to get like a rare pressing of of uh, excluding rare, like rare releases to begin with, but like out of like the, the 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 wide releases of Beatles stuff, I think that this is like the most coveted one you can get. It's like an original pressing of of the White Album with a serial number, uh, pre- preferably not stained or dirtied, which is difficult considering well, it's it's the White Album. Um, but yeah, otherwise this thing, considering its eclectic nature, uh, did really well on the charts, um, and it sold. Apparently, it sold 3.3 million copies within the first four days, which is redonkulous. So, there you have it. Um, As for the lasting legacies of these albums, both have done really, really well. Here's a quick recap of the White Album. So, the White Album is one of the top-reviewed things of Metacritic. The deluxe version, which was a recent release, is a perfect 100. So, that means nobody gave it a, a less of a score than... I think it has to be like 90 something for it to, to take up that, that upper echelon of the rating scale. So mm-hmm. a perfect 100. Um, otherwise, it's like borderline perfect ratings across the board. Um, it's considered one of the greatest albums of all time. It's got a lot of discussion points, including the influence of Helter Skelter, 
the oddity of Revolution 9, um, a lot of underrated gems which people bring up. Uh, I didn't even bring up Bungalow Bill, which you did, a fantastic song. Um, I think it just lends itself to being arguably the most conversation-heavy Beatles album because it's like, why do you like this song? I like this one instead. Um, what's going on with this eight-minute avant-garde thing? So many talking points. But then you've got Sgt. Pepper's, which has had its own legacy. Yep. Uh, so, gosh, uh, where does one begin with Sgt. Pepper's? Well, critically, it's gone back and forth to back again. So when it came out, uh, it was called considered a pop music master class. And it won the Grammy for album of the year. Yes, it sure did. It was the first rock album to ever receive a Grammy for an album of the year. Um, it was considered a masterpiece. It was considered uh, an, uh, the, the sound of the times. It was, uh, it's very linked, uh, very closely linked with uh, with uh, the the coming of the, the 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 flower power and the psychedelic like generation, um, people said it, they, that somehow the Beatles had managed to elevate pop music to art. Uh, uh, Kenneth Tynan of the the Times uh, said it represented a decisive moment in the history of Western civilization. As as time progresses, uh, as most things do, uh, the love for Sgt. Pepper's has kind of dwindled down a bit. People started referring to it as being very pompous uh, because it was the 80s. It was cool to shit all over anything that came from the 60s because you're dealing with a lot of people doing a lot of coke and not realizing that uh, being able to protest things wasn't so bad. Uh, so there's a lot of... I guess there was a lot attached to that specifically looking at it as not so much as a great album but a great album of its time period and we're no longer in that time period so it's not a great album it was kind of like how the critical look at it it was however as as from the 80s on it kind of bounced back again and people are saying okay you know it's not the velvet underground and nico mm -hmm. it's uh, something completely different and it's it's amazing like when I was doing my research for this, I said, okay, what can I really do? What can I, in case this is a close competition, and I, I, I truly believe based off of what you said with the White Album, this is going to be a lot closer than I thought it would be. Um, <clears throat> so I decided to toss out a couple of random hits to see if they would win people to my side or not. <laughs> All right. Uh uh, oh gosh, I am gonna kick myself because I am now. I I you know what? Give me one second. Mm -hmm. Fuck, I knew it. Robert Fripp, because I I brain fart like the best of them. Robert Fripp heavily was heavily influenced by it, so much influenced by it that when they formed King Crimson. Their album in the court of the Crimson King was intended as an homage to Sgt. Pepper's. Really? With, without Sgt. Pepper's, um, it's hard to say if anybody would have attempted to do uh, a cohesive theme album. So you can then say without Sgt. Pepper's, there would have been no Ziggy Stardust, Spires from Mars. Uh, love them or hate them, you would say there would be no OK computer. There definitely wouldn't be their Satanic Majesty's request. And there sure as hell wouldn't have been a Dark Side of the Moon. Because uh, it's been said when do, doing interviews with Floyd that um, listening to Sgt. Pepper's, they realized you can be more introspective more introspective in your writing and be okay with that which again wasn't just the Beatles doing that it was the Beatles getting that from from hanging out with Dylan and I'm not a Dylan fan at all I think he's uh, I, there's some stuff he's really great at I but, but I think he's I think he's kind of writing his own coattails and kind of 
that's it. See, this is where you and I are going to get into like a heated conflict <laughs> on on the air. When when somebody nominates Dylan, I'm taking Dylan. <laughs> Please don't, please don't, uh, please don't, please don't nominate <laughs> Dylan because I'll just be like, uh, there is no argument here. Whichever one your side you're gonna vote, you're gonna you're gonna champion. I'm gonna go along with you with it because you can't uh, escape the Dylan <laughs> ghost. <laughs> oh God, uh, but yeah, with it without Dylan having that, give showing them that hey, it's okay to write these these personal songs. It doesn't just have to be like generic crap pop music you can write about stuff that means something to you the beatles took that and said okay awesome we're gonna do that and then in turn they was like they they influenced pink floyd they had a huge influence on dark side of the moon for that uh and as for the stones i mean people always can always like say well who's better the stones or the beatles i would say album wise the beatles were better better i would say the stones were a better singles band Mm -hmm. uh but their satanic majesty's request when def- it's like, a direct yeah. rip yeah 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 because they're just like oh hey we're gonna hey like we're 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 hanging out with people that do drugs too guys hey yeah we can do kind of something crazy we're gonna add satan in there because it's gonna be all scary and rock and roll right guys well <sighs> what i think is interesting is you brought up you know like uh kid a and uh, uh no you brought up a okay computer and Ziggy yep. stardust um, mm-hmm. While I won't pretend that the White Album had an influence on this, I, I do feel like that this type of an album from a popular artist, especially with some of the more experimental cuts, made it okay for people like Bowie to do Low if you wanted, or for Radiohead to do Kid A if they wanted. Like, this was one of the first times that this type of thing had happened, where they were testing the waters with Helter Skelter, Revolution 9, and it was basically like, hey, at this point, we can make cohesive music, or we can do literally whatever the fuck we want. And that's that to me is why, because like I love Low, that's my favorite Bowie. I love Kid A, that's my favorite Radiohead. So naturally, mm-hmm. like White Album only makes sense, and it's my favorite Beatles. Yeah, totally. And I cannot. I and I. You know what? I'll give you that point by also saying that if it wasn't for Obladi Oblada, we wouldn't have had the third wave wave of ska coming out of like southern u.s so thank you white album thank you so very fucking much for bombarding us with lackluster fucking ska ripoff bands but alas uh, life goes on so Uh, uh, so i guess that's pretty much it i guess uh, let us know what you think is the winner is it sergeant pepper's only hearts club band or the beatles by the beatles both albums by the beatles so that's pretty much it and uh, how do we wrap this up john well, I'd like to thank you all for listening to us talk about these albums. Um, with the when this gets posted up, we'll have links built in uh, where you can send in your nominations. We've got a couple to go through already, so don't uh, don't wonder if something's been received and it's not going to be. We're going to do every single nomination that comes through, and so far from the nominations that we have been receiving. There is a metric crap ton of music I have not listened to at all because uh, it's a bit of a me. Well, I'm a reformed music snob. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff I didn't bother listening to because I just couldn't be bothered because it didn't match uh, my current palette at that point in time. Uh, but I've mellowed out. I'm a lot more open to stuff than I was before. So it's going to be interesting to at least listen to those albums while talking, while also being able to defend them properly and talk about how great they are. Because obviously somebody loves them, and I mean, it can't all be that bad, right? And even if it is, that'll be part of the fun. Can we, def- <laughs> can we defend stuff that we don't even like? Let's let's get outside of our comfort zones a little bit. Exactly. And uh, so, yeah, so we'll have the link where you guys can submit your nominations as well as vote for which album beat or is more influential or however you want to say it. Just, just go with whichever album you think is the best of the two. And finally, uh, the contest portion. So as, as Andreas and I have talked about, we've discussed two albums today. Uh, and your job is to find the common denominator between these two albums. 
the first person to properly give us the correct answer as to what's the common common element between these two albums uh, wins the prize. In this case, uh, it will be an uh, anti-social media t-shirt. Uh, so, yeah, uh, there's plenty to give up. So when you do send them in, uh, your stuff, also, please, please, please uh, make it a bit easier for us and let us know what shirt size you wear. Uh, so we can make sure that when we do send it out, oh gosh, and your mailing address. I'm just like, all these things are popping in my head at the same time. Uh, again, forgive me. It's our first, first recording. Uh, send all that information in. And, uh, like I said, the, we'll, we'll have a winner and we'll get you guys sent off. And then with the, the next episode, which, uh, will be recorded and sent out, uh, sometime later, uh, we'll announce the winner of the previous uh, previous uh, competition. We'll also name uh, the winner of uh, of uh, the contest. So good luck to you all. Thank you so much for listening. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for uh, having me on and, and wanting to do this with me. This has been like, I think it's like three or four years in the making. Um, yeah. And uh, otherwise, thank you for listening. And we can't wait to have even more bonkers uh head-to-heads so let's do this please send in your most ridiculous your most ridiculous stimulating interesting request sorry interesting requests yep and also always make sure when you do send them in in close to them as well what their common tying bond is so at least then you're not putting two random albums together and then someone's trying to randomly guess and say uh oh they were both recorded uh, they both came out in the last century. Uh, so something as long as it's very, uh, it's a clear uh, tie, then that'd be awesome. Yeah, no, um, no stretches. So like, even though I love both artists, we're not going to do um, Lana Del Rey and Knock Mistium simply because they're both American music. Like that doesn't work. Like something that at least has some sort of like cohesion. Exactly. Exactly. Well, again, thank you so much, guys for and gals uh, for listening. Uh, again, I'm John. And I'm Andreas. And this was Loveless Will Tear Us Apart. Shh, 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 shh.